Hello everyone and happy CRO day. Hope you're enjoying the multitude of ideas and great content out there today as part of this special event. I'm Michelle Verstig, Director of Marketing with Cardinal Path and we're proud to be partnering with Unbounce and participating in CRO day. So welcome to this webinar. Are you using Google Analytics to drive real business value? If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit them through the questions panel on your screen and we'll address them later in the presentation. Send as many questions as you have, and if we don't get to them live, we promise to follow up with you by email in short order. You can also join the conversation on Twitter using hashtag CRO Day. We are recording this session, and everyone who registered will get an email with a link to the on-demand webinar. A bit about Cardinal Path, we're a digital data analytics firm that helps organizations unlock the value in their data and move the business forward based on those insights. Our teams comprise some of the top minds in the digital space, and our aim is to share all that we know. And actually, just last week, the Digital Analytics Association named Cardinal Path the most influential agency of the year. A huge honor, and we are so grateful for the recognition. And now I'll introduce our speaker. John Hossack is president and co-founder of Cardinal Path. He's been working with organizations to help them improve the performance of their online channels for over 13 years. John is a thought leader and a sought-after speaker in the analytics, usability, and conversion testing space. And he's also past president of the International Internet Marketing Association. With, ja with that, John, I will hand over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Michelle, and thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank my friends at Unbounce for getting us involved in the CRO Day. We're very excited to be a part of it. We've got a really big group with us today, which has got me really excited. I'm hoping you're seeing my screen at this point. You should be seeing my handsome photo there. Um, and uh, we'll be moving on in just a few moments. The theme of the day is Google Analytics and tricks for conversion rate optimization. We've packed as many tips and tricks as we can think of into the time we have available to us. So let's get started. I like to think about what we'll be talking about today like a freight train leaving the station. Once this freight train sets in motion and gets up to speed, look out because good things are going to happen. Today we'll talk about conversion rate optimization and how GA can help take your game to the next level. I'm sure that many of you listening already use GA um, to some extent and may be very familiar with it, and others it will be brand new. Regardless, I hope that everyone is going to learn a few things here today and be able to start thinking about their approach to conversion rate optimization and how GA can help. The first bullet point focuses on how to use GA to create segments and define groups that have the most value to us. We can focus our conversion rate activities on them. Then we'll talk about how we can target and remarket to these newly discovered valuable segments that we've identified. Then we'll dive into a little known feature around product data that will help us to upsell and cross-sell more effectively to our most valuable audiences. Additionally, we'll talk about how some of GA's e-commerce reports have evolved, giving us better insight to what we're looking for from an e-commerce perspective. Don't worry if you're not an e-commerce business, because a lot of this stuff will apply to you even if you're not selling things online. Finally, we'll talk about how you can personalize your content to supercharge your conversion optimization efforts by creating personalized offers and campaigns to radically improve your conversion rates. So with that being said, let's dive in. So the first thing we're going to talk about is segments. As we know that not every visitor that comes to our site is the same, and therefore we should not treat them all the same. It's probably best to start at the beginning. What is segmentation exactly? If you've used Google Analytics or any other modern analytics tool for that matter, for any length of time, you're probably very used to segmenting your data, even if you don't think of it in those terms. In the context of digital analytics, all segmentation is is the notion of taking your aggregate data and breaking it down into its component parts. I like to think of segmentation as the slicing and dicing of your data in ways that make it possible for you to get insights about subsets based on something that they've done and have in common with each other. When we have the ability to distinguish between first-time visitors versus somebody who's been to your site 25 times in one day, we can start to provide different experiences both on-site and in our campaigns to these different user types. Each of these segments is going to perform differently. A 
against the goals for our website, and we want to be able to take advantage of this knowledge that we have about the different visitors. So we can see things from people who've never been to our site before, people who are accessing via different devices, be it mobile or desktop, geographies, do they live in California, new customers, loyal customers, and the different types of campaigns that they've reached us through. So how, do we, how do we find these valuable segments? Let's get started and see how we can use the concept of segmentation to find some high value groups or segments. A great place to start is to think about how your segments or your visitors fall into different audiences or sections. By looking down this list here, we have an available set of reports that focus on attributes and behaviors and even demographics that will help us segment our visitors by their differences, specifically which ones are more valuable to our business versus those that are less. We're going to start by looking at reports that are available as a result of a double-click double -click audience integration. For this integration provides us with very interesting demographic data. To start with we're going to click on the demographic audience data and we're going to see that different age groups behave in very different ways. We can quickly and easily see here by clicking on this compare link. And we like to always click on the compare link because it really helps us figure out some of the differences much more quickly than the other reports. Once you've clicked on the compare link, you'll see here that we've got the ages broken down by 10-year bands, and then we're looking at revenue, and then what that revenue is like versus the site average. From this, we can gain some very interesting insights. In this case, we see that 25 to 34-year-olds and 35 to 44-year-olds make us the most money, and the younger spectrum and the older spectrum aren't performing nearly as well. So to start with, we'll want to make sure that we have our money being spent on the segments that generate our most revenue and check against how much money we're spending against these other segments to make sure that we're not spending more to attract these customers than we're actually making from them. Now that we know this, we might even change our messaging to try to appeal more to these groups that aren't performing well, as maybe we're excluding them in our messaging, and that's why they're not responding well. As a bit of a recap for those that are familiar to Google Analytics, Google Analytics lets us dive in by further applying secondary dimensions. By doing this, we're now looking at the age breakdown in addition to the gender. It's often the case that it's not as simple to say that a particular age range is the best one for us. What we see here is that that given age range doesn't behave the same. Within that age range, the gender contribution is very different. So when we use the secondary dimension of gender inside of age, we get a whole new look at everything. I like to call this secondary dimension dicing what we've already sliced. We now get a more granular look at who's worth the most to our business and we can focus our efforts on attracting more people from these segments. In this case, females in the 35 to 55 age range. So we've seen how GA reports have some features built in that allow us to get to a level of segmentation that we might not have been doing before. However, there's much more to segmentation in GA than just this. One of Google Analytics' most popular and powerful features is called advanced segmentation. Using advanced segmentation, you can build your own custom segments, save and share them, use them on any report, and not have to go through all the manual workflow of applying secondary dimensions every time. Advanced segmentation allows us to take an even basic report, like an e-commerce overview here, and gain some very useful insights. If we click the Add Segment icon, we'll have the option to use system segments, which Google provides for us out of the box, or custom segments that we've already built. When applying these segments, our report refreshes and every metric is now segmented along these dimensions. Now, instead of seeing our aggregate conversions rates, we're able to uncover that conversion rate is much lower when users using a mobile phone are on our site versus those on a tablet or a desktop. This can be very helpful information. What we very quickly notice here is that our conversion rate on mobile is much lower than desktop. There could be a number of reasons for this, including a horrible mobile experience, or that the mobile channel plays a very different but important role in our customer lifecycle journey. That is one where the conversion doesn't take place, but potentially where they first learn about our product or offering or they engage with us further after they become a customer, becoming more loyal and becoming our advocate. 
Google offers a lot of segmentations that come out of the box. However, the best part about that and segmentations is that we can create our own segments using a simple wizard that lets us specify and set our conditions. So, if we click on a new segment, we can specify the condition that we consider, in this case, defining a highly engaged visitor. Here we've said that a session needs to include three or more page views and last more than 120 seconds. Any session that meets these criteria will fall into the highly engaged bucket. Notice here that we've said that we're trying to segment on highly engaged visitors, but we're actually, but not, sorry, not visitors, but on sessions that meet the criteria. In other words, we're asking GA to show me all the sessions that met these criteria, as opposed to show me all the people who have met these criteria. Stay tuned and we'll dive deeper into the importance of this topic in just a moment. Finally, here I want to point out that you're not limited to the hundreds of dimensions that GA provides you. You can also use your own custom dimensions that use data that you inject into Google Analytics. Let's say you know something about the attributes of your visitor. For example, they fill out a form where they state their industry. They choose a drop-down box that indicates their gender. Maybe you know they're a gold subscriber because they've logged in and your CRM indicates that, or they've reached level five in your game. Google Analytics doesn't know this stuff by default, but you do, and you can pass this information into Google Analytics using custom dimensions. Once GA knows what's up, you can build segments using these dimensions and use the same process we just defined. An important note, be sure not to add any personally identifiable information via custom dimensions. This information would also be known as PII. Google Analytics has a very strict interpretation inside their terms of service that would create a violation uh, with respect to how you're using the tool. So keep any personal information or PII out of custom dimensions. So how do we get these custom dimensions into GA? Well, we start from the admin section. The first thing you want to define is the dimension in the GA interface. Here we'll create one called customer type. Once we save that, as you'll see, this part only takes a few minutes. Then we'll get some JavaScript code. This is where you'll need to work with the developer. But as you can see here, we're setting a dimension, and that's the dimension that needs a value. Here we can insert a variable that we have to indicate that the user is customer type. In this example, they could be gold, silver, or bronze. For more information on how to do this, there's a link at the bottom of the slide for those who are more technically inclined to figure out all the nuts and bolts of how this works. Okay, now let's switch gears a bit. Now that we know how to segment our visitors, find visitors that have higher value than those that don't by slicing our visitors and look at custom dimensions and secondary dimensions to dice the data using comparative reports to show us quickly where we should focus our efforts. Now let's talk about how we can make more money from this new information. To do this, we need to understand how to target these specific groups that we've just learned how to identify. Well, the first thing we can do is target these groups with the ad platforms that we're already using. For example, gender and age targeting are available as targeting dimensions in the AdWords platform, as well as geography and many more. If you're a double-click client or another ad-serving platform is of your choice, you'll also have more advanced targeting options at your fingertips. The point is that you can focus your campaigns to target the groups who you know add the most value to your business and spend less on those who don't add as much value to your business. First, I always like to help people by building segments around their high value users so that they can remarket to these people who've already been to their website and done something that will add value to their business and they've identified themselves as a high value segment. Of course, the definition of high value can vary widely depending on the business model, your goals, and so on. Let's see a few different examples to give you some ideas. GA makes creating remarketing segments really easy. First, for an e-commerce business, you might want to be able to build a segment for people who spend the most money with you. Here, we'll have a segment called Purchased Big Ticket Items. We can see that we've said that we want to segment users whose revenue exceeds $500. Of course, that threshold could be much higher or lower depending on what makes sense for you and your business. Anyway, if you look closely, you'll see that we're segmenting on users whose revenue per session exceeds $500. However, you could change this segment 
to be on users whose total value or overall revenue across multiple sessions exceeds $500. Again, how you define these segments is totally up to you. Let's say you're not an e-commerce business. You could segment on people who downloaded a PDF, watched a video, requested a quote, and so on. So we could have a segment that contains all the users who have downloaded a PDF as an example, if we're a lead gen business. You could even define a segment like this without even using reference to a specific conversion. An interesting one, for example, would be to segment all the people <clears throat> who have had at least three sessions on the site but haven't had a session in the past seven days. This might indicate to us a group of people or a segment that we're at risk of losing as they're no longer engaging with us. Creating these segments is great. You get all kinds of great insights about some very special people. For example, where do people come from? What devices do they use? How frequently do they return to your site? Are they signing up for your email list? But one of the biggest things about creating these audience segments in Google Analytics is that you can now take these people from Google Analytics and push them into AdWords and target them with special campaigns. This opens the door to a ton of different opportunities. For example, we can isolate specific segments and then target them with personalized messages, offers, and more. Let's see how that works. We click the Build an Audience button, and then it's as simple as that. It pushes this information into AdWords. Now when we log into AdWords, and look, we have a different targeting criteria. I see that we have available a remarketing list called Purchased Big Ticket Items. And GA will continue to populate this list as more people qualify to be a part of it. Now we can create an ad focused on this group, as we know they're highly likely to convert with this specific ad as they travel across the web. This helps us get the right message to the right person at the right time in the right place. I hope that was a good review for some and a good intro for the rest. Now we're going to switch gears again and talk about product data. My hope here is that this section is new for most people and will provide you with the information that you need to take action in the future to improve your CRO. There's definitely been an evolution in analytics platforms and technologies that are available. First, all we knew from Google Analytics was that somebody bought something after the fact, and this wasn't particularly helpful. Then things got a lot better when GA launched the enhanced e-commerce features last year. Now we're able to figure out what they were interested in buying but didn't buy, and more predictive type of information as such, as opposed to just information once it had happened. What we want to strive for is to know what people are going to buy before they buy it. If we can get this insight into what people are going to buy, this can really help us improve our approach to content, campaigns, and results in improvements in our conversion rates. To help solve this issue, we'll talk about a little-known feature that can help towards this. So back in the caveman days, we had basic reports that told us how many units we sold, unique purchases, product revenue, average order size, average quantity, and such. We could do some analysis here, but to be honest, it wasn't all that exciting. We had to ask ourselves, why am I looking at these reports? One exception might have been the time to, time to purchase report that's see on the left navigation, as this would tell us how many days and how many visits it took for people to buy. This was some pretty useful information, but other than that, it was pretty tough to get excited about these reports. Now with GA's enhanced e-commerce, we're getting visibility on the customer buying lifecycle. This can be really powerful. If you think about just tracking what was purchased before enhanced e-commerce came out, we were just seeing this little segment, what was purchased. But there's a lot more to it than that. The journey always starts with awareness. Then usually we need some recognition of a need. Once there's a recognition that they have a need for a product or service, customers will look for alternatives and evaluate how our offering fits in versus the rest. This leads into more in-depth research. And then back to evaluation again. And if we're lucky, it's a purchase on our site. But that's not where it stops either. There's potentially a lot of information to be gathered post-purchase as well. This is the entire customer lifecycle, most of which we had little visibility into. But now with enhanced e-commerce, much more of this journey is exposed to us. From an enhanced e-commerce perspective, it's a whole new way of looking at the path to purchase. It's not just at the transaction level of what was purchased. Now we can see the path to purchase from how they came to our website through which campaign, which products they looked at, which products they added to cart, 
and ultimately which products they purchased. And then we can segment by that. Specifically of interest, things can be that somebody added to the cart but didn't purchase. This can send us a really important intent signal. This gives us a lot more data to play with so that we can better personalize the content and our campaigns. Think of what we could do if we could customize a remarketing message knowing that they added something to cart and likely wanted to buy it but haven't actually bought it yet. With access to this new data in GA, we can now create segments of people based on new dimensions that are now available in the enhanced e-commerce section. We can now quickly create segments like people who've added things to cart but did not purchase and then remarket to them. So we are in the crawl phase. We were in the crawl phase with the old Google Analytics. Now with enhanced e-commerce, we are starting to evolve into the walking upright, and soon we're going to be in the section where we're picking up speed and starting to run as we start talking about a little secret that most people aren't aware of. Those who are parents of younger kids out there, and I'm one of them, this situation is a bit of a nightmare. You see your child being excluded from something that they very much want to be a part of, and everything in your heart wants to help them be a part of the group. But in the business world, it's a doggy dog world, and it's cut and right. And you want to be the one who's in the know, and you're hoping your competitors are the one who are excluded from the little secret. This little secret is related products. A lot of people aren't aware of the related products feature, as it isn't a part of the GA interface. I'll walk you through how to access it in a minute, but first we'll explain what it is and what it does. To help illustrate related products, I'll use our own business as an example. Cardinal Path not only provides consulting services to help organizations with their data and analytics, with their AdWords and customer acquisition, and with their optimization and CRO efforts, but we also offer a lot of training. This training is basically one product, a training class, but we have a number of different classes. We have AdWords 101 and 201. We have Google Analytics training in a 101, 201, and 301 version, and we offer these training in cities across North America. We want people sign up for as many of these training days as possible. Having sign up, having someone sign up for two, three, four, and even five training days is clearly a lot more valuable to us than having somebody sign up for just one day. So how do we figure out which classes are purchased together and have the best opportunity for us to cross sell and upsell? Figuring out which projects or products are purchased together is a key signal for us to customize our marketing effort. So as I mentioned, we aren't looking at the Google Analytics interface here, but we need to actually approach this via the API. So for all the techies who are out there and listening and got excited because I said the word API, and the rest you said, oh crap, this sounds too technical for me. Uh, the good news is for the non-techies. Google's created a GA Query Explorer so that the non-techies, like myself, can make API calls behind the scenes, bring back data they want without needing to know how to code. You'll find a link at the top of the slide here for more information. Using the API to get related product data will help us to predict what people want to buy next and create segments based on this data. First thing you'll be asked to do is log in with your Google account credentials. In this case, you'll see I'm logged in with Cardinal Path with a UA-enabled property, UA standing for Universal Analytics, and the profile I'm looking at is our master profile that has all of our data, not just our training pages. Okay. Here might be the most technical thing we're going to look at today, but stick with me as it really isn't that bad. Step one is you need to make sure your GAID is in there. It should be pre-populated, so this is a pretty easy thing to take care of. Next, we need to carve out the dimensions and metrics that we'll want to make available via the GA interface. To do this, you'll click on the dimensions drop down and scroll all the way to the bottom of the big long window to get to the related products section. Once you're there, you're going to focus on the product ID, product name, and the product name for both the query and related. Next, we need our metric. Again, click the drop down, scroll all the way to the bottom, find the related products, and we're going to check off the correlation score, the product quality, and the product quantity. As with any query, you can also make it more complex with filters and sorting rules. Here's a quick filter that I'll leave you with. In this case, we only want to look at products where we sold more than 20. This will help us eliminate those one-off sales that just don't provide the volume to justify optimizing for. 
Also notice in the sort section that the first symbol is a little minus symbol. This will then set in descending order the correlation scores. So what does all this mean? Well, now we let Google work its magic to calculate the likelihood of two products being purchased together. This is how we can see which products relate to each other. The last step is to click the Get Data button, and it will show us a table of data that we requested, and we can send that over to Excel. So this is real data from our trading site, right down at the product ID level. We see the cities and the courses that people sign up for. When we dive in here, we see there's a high correlation of people who signed up for the GA101 course and the GA201 course in San Diego. So there's a really good likelihood for us to sell the 201 course together with the 101 course. Much more likely, as it turns out, to sell the two GA101 and 201 courses together than it is to sell the GA101 and the AdWiz 101, which actually may have been our hypothesis. We may have thought that many people would like to be at the work not likely that are at the same level, so they'd be taking an introductory course to analytics and an introductory course to AdWords at the same time. But it turns out that that's not the case. So from this, we know that a lot of people have purchased GA101 and 201 together, but we can also see that there are a lot of people who still haven't gone that far to purchase the second course. I want to take this knowledge and get more of those people who haven't purchased GA201 and actually get them to buy it. So let's put this in action. First thing, I can do this on the website itself in real time. When I know that someone's about to purchase 101 and not 201 in San Diego, I can add a message or an offer to try and entice them or convince them that they should pick both together. In this case, I've decided to put an offer in front of them that if they decide to take 201 as well, we'll take $50 off the price. We know that many people see value in taking both of these courses together. So in some cases, we just need to push people a little harder to get them to convert. We can also use this data to drive merchandising decisions. And in this case, by merchandising, I'm meaning the same thing, taking 201 once you've already purchased 101. We've all been to sites that try and do this for us. When we buy one item and they suggest another, if you're buying pants, they say, how about a belt? If you're buying shoes, how about socks? A swimsuit, do you need goggles? Amazon's great at this to the point that I don't even have to worry about what I need next or what I'm running out of, but instead I just go to Amazon and they tell me what I need, and I buy it. But in this case, we're going to update a few of the marketing blocks. To call out our 201 to someone I know has purchased 101 but not 201 yet, we can customize this with any message we want and use any area of the website that we can control. Certifiably insane is the message here. If you've taken 101 and haven't signed up for 201 yet, we truly thank you. Crazy. Outside of your website, you can use this data to really amp up your email performance. Many people have tons of data at the CRM level and a ton of data in their email platform. With this data, you can run quick queries to get lists of people who have bought 101 but not 201 in San Diego. Now, once I have that information, I can specifically target these people that I truly believe are highly likely to convert by sending a message directly to their inbox. This is not a spray and pray blast. We know these people have bought 201, and we know that a lot of people bought 201 want, sorry, bought 101, a lot of people want to buy 201 as well. This will increase my likelihood of getting a conversion. But if you look at the text specifically on this slide, I'll give away a little bit of our secret sauce. When we're following up with people, offering unicorns and trained fighting monkeys really seems to get them interested. Again, what's interesting about this is that we can do this through Google Analytics, right back with the idea of segmentation. Here we're building a custom segment of people who've purchased GA101 but not 201 yet. I can now apply this segment to a report and build an audience. Building of the audience is a very important function because this is how we end up pushing the information into AdWords for people who are using the AdWords platform or if you're a Google Analytics Premium client, as well as a DoubleClick customer, you can export these lists directly into the DoubleClick. This has just given us tremendous reach with laser targeting. Personalization. So we've been talking about personalization, and we're going to continue along this path. What we want to do is provide the right offer to the right people at the right time in the right place to maximize our conversion rates. 
We've looked at a lot of ways to do this already, but there are even more. The key we've seen so far is to segment our data, identify those segments that are the most valuable, and take advantage of that information. So let's continue with the crawl, walk, run approach. Start with the low-hanging fruit that you can do with the tools that you have in place already, which you're probably not using yet. Then move on to some more advanced features within that same tool set beyond the low-hanging fruit and take advantage of those. And finally, when we're getting ready to get up to scale and run, we can start looking at other tools that are available outside of Google Analytics to really help amp up our ability to segment and target visitors who are the most valuable customers. Let's start with the problem. Google Analytics campaign tagging. This is a great and important way for us to tell Google Analytics the source of the traffic that's arriving at our website. So in this case, let's look at our email. The button in the email is really just the link to the landing page on our website. This is the URL it may go to, and it looks like a normal URL at the start, but the mess to the right, that's the campaign tag. Don't worry if you think this looks technical as there are tools out there to help you generate your own campaign tags and you don't have to build these manually by hand. But let's break it down. First off, be sure that this doesn't change the landing page they get to at all. It just tells GA the exact source of the visit so it can classify it properly. It breaks up into five parameters, but the most important ones are here, which are medium, which in this case is set to email, Source, which in this case is set to product. It's a product email. And campaign. In this case, it's a campaign to upsell people to the 201 course. You can label things any way you want. There are no rules, and Google doesn't care how you name things. Then in GA, you can look at these dimensions, run reports, and apply segments to them. I'm sure some of you are already pros at this, but let's take this in a different direction now. Now that I think this information will catch people who come to my website so I can customize the content, we'll see with some very simple personalization. If I find the parameters here, I can actually change the content on the page. I can change the image, a header, a call to action, and more. I already know the person received my email because they bought GA101, which triggered it, and not 201, which triggered an email, and then they clicked the link to come to my site. With the campaign tagging, my site picks this up, and let's see what we can do with this. So now we work with our web developer. We've identified three different areas that we want to control if we identify a specific segment that we want to customize for when they arrive at a certain page. Let's look at changing the image, updating the headline, and maybe even think of an overlay. Here we've got a fire sale for 20% off today only. We might not want to offer this overlay right away because we might not want to give somebody a discount if we don't have to. We can choose to provide this overlay later in their session. Let's look at a specific example here as well that's related to uh, CRO day that we're a part of here. In content online that's promoting this event, we can have a link out there. And in some cases, uh, we're not going to be able to set our campaign variables. But if we can, what we want is a medium here, partner, a source, CRO day, and a campaign segmentation because that's the topic of today's event. These three parameters tell me a lot, not just that they came to my site from a CRO day page, but it tells me what they're interested in, and that's really valuable to me. But for a moment, let's go back and let's pretend that I didn't set these campaign variables or that I couldn't get it done. Well, don't panic just yet. All is not lost. A little bit on the technical side here, but don't worry. Uh, information does get passed in the header. This information tells me a lot of what I'd get out of the campaign tagging if I was able to have it. When your site loads a web page, one of the things in the header request you'll see is the referring information. And in this particular case, there aren't any more UTM parameters that I can key off of, but instead I can have my developers look for the information that's in this referring section of the header. If this matches what I'm looking for, 
So if, it, if the header contains X, I can then customize for Y. And Y can be whatever you want. We've talked about many different things, changing images, changing headers, changing calls to action, overlays. If you can control that area of your site, you can key off of that to customize the content and optimize your ability to engage with your visitors. Here's another example on our homepage. If we don't know anything about you, you'll land on our homepage and you'll see a message that looks like this. Here, you'll see content where we're talking about our maturity benchmarking service, an online analytics maturity assessment. It'll help you get lots of information and compare yourself against others of similar size and similar industries, etc. It's a great tool for us, and our people who use it get a ton of value out of it. However, if I actually know something about you because of information that's in the header or information in campaign tag, I can do more to customize the content. If I know that somebody's come from that conversion rate day page, I can change my content to talk about services that are more conversion rate focused have calls to action, offers that are different from the default of my maturity benchmarking offer. In this case, contact us today to talk about segmentation. So we can walk. We talked about the UTM parameters, and there are so many other parameters we can use too. We're not done there. If your site has search functionality, we can key off of what people are searching for and search is a tremendous source of intent information. In this case, we see that they're searching for Austin, but I know that they're wanting training in Austin, Texas. So not only can I serve up my search results for Austin, Texas, I can customize that based on search parameter information. With this personalization, there can be offers, images, and much more. This is what the query strength parameter looks like, and your developer can help you walk through it, but you will see towards the right side, Q equals Austin. That's what we're keying off of here. So then we'll write a query that if Q contains Austin, we'll change the picture, we'll change the text, we can have an overlay. It's almost limitless. If we have access to it, we can control it. In this case, we decided to give somebody 10% off but, as I mentioned before, you don't have to choose to give them 10% off right in the search result page. You could delay that to a later point in the session so that you're not giving someone a discount who isn't needing a discount to actually sign up. That's something that you'll want to play with and experiment to figure out if it works for you or not. One of the things that people wise up to is that by actually abandoning certain procedures or processes on your website, they'll sit back and wait for deals because many different businesses will offer a deal right out of the gate. Now we're going to start running uh, a bit back with the idea of custom dimensions and custom variables. We talked about setting up custom data variables about your visitors before. To do this, we need to know two things to set up in GA, and we need to add some code to your site. What this code does is it tells GA when someone's done something that we want to know about. In this example, we're looking for someone who logs in, and we're going to look up what level of status they are. Then, this will set a GA dimension, in this case, dimension 4. Now, GA knows that this person is a silver member. Now, you'll want to work with your developer to get this code set in a cookie, so you notice this when the visitor comes back. In this case, we're setting a cookie at a silver level, and we'll have it expire in 30 days. It doesn't have to be 30 days. It could be 60 days, 90 days, whatever you want. The great thing about this is now we'll have access to this data about this user because we've cookied them down the line. This extra step allows the ability to act on the information at a later date, and this is really important to us because a lot of the time it's these future actions that we really need to take advantage of, and now we have the hook via the cookie to implement against it. Now we can access and read the rules around the cookie and we can write script to customize the content on our site. In this case, if they're a silver customer, one of the things that might be very important to us is to figure out how to convert them to a gold customer. So we might have a campaign that launches a pop-up, letting people know, or the specific user know, that if they fly three more segments in the next, next 30 days, they'll have earned their gold status. And to some people, that little prod is all it's going to take to get them to fly that airline three times in the next month versus a competitor's because these people who are flying all the time really enjoy the perks. 
So for those of you who are wondering why we have to do things this way, as in the past there were alternative methods, as a result of the Universal Analytics Code, we lost access to the UTMD cookie, and this is now how we approach this problem or opportunity. The last thing I want to talk about in the running phase is that there are many other ways to do this beyond just using Google Analytics and your ad serving platforms. We've been talking about and focusing on what you can do with GA and the help of your developer, but there are a bunch of great tools out there that can help you do this and so many more amazing things with many different data sources. Really fun things such as weather and seasonality. You can use lead scoring from your CRM. If you're collecting data on it, you can use it. The combinations and permutations are almost endless. Now, I'm not here to promote any specific tool. There are lots of great tools out there, some more focused on e-commerce, others lead gen, but they're all focused on improving your ability to make segmentation decisions to get the most valuable customers, the right information, the right message, the right promotion, the right offer at the right time, ultimately leading to a great customer experience and driving your business with more conversions. I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time with me today. I hope you got some great value out of that. I hope for those who already knew a lot about this, they found a nugget or two that they can run with and implement. And for those that are taking copious notes, I hope you found a few things, some of the lower hanging fruit that you can take advantage of in the coming weeks. Again, I'd like to thank Unbounce and my friends there for having Cardinal Path involved with CRO Day. And at this point, I'll turn it back over to Michelle. Thank you, John. We do have a few questions that we have time to address today. Some of them are through the uh, question panel and some of them are through social media via Twitter. So the first question for you is, uh, what about enhanced e-commerce? Is that a custom report? Well, that's a great question. As it's a new feature, uh, there are probably a few questions out there around that. Enhanced e-commerce is not actually a, a new report, but it's a complete overhaul of how they report on e-commerce. A few steps, you need to go into Google Analytics administration and enable it there. And when you do that, you'll need to retool your website. So you're going to have to redeploy some code because there's a bunch of information that can get sent to populate data in these new enhanced e-commerce reports that doesn't just show up on its own. So unfortunately, this isn't something that's as simple as just flipping a switch or checking a box and it's going to work for you. You actually do have to go and make some code changes to your site so that your site is sending new information so that you can populate all these new dimensions. From my perspective, it's completely worth it. Um, one of the things to be wary of, though, is if you haven't upgraded to Universal Analytics or UA yet, you will have to do that for this feature and any other new feature as it is the de facto code base for all the new feature releases. Just to add to that, because many people have been asking me lately, um, what are the things we should do? And if you don't have enhanced e-commerce set up yet, and you are e-commerce, you absolutely want to do that. As I mentioned, you'll need to have UA or Universal Analytics implemented first. And if you haven't done it already, what you should do at the same time is basically a little three-pack of work is to you to put a tag management system in place and a free one out there that works very well with this suite is GTM or Google Tag Manager. So if you're not UA enabled, you haven't put uh, enhanced e-commerce in, and you're not using GTM, it's a great time to do all those three things at once. And just one other thing, Michelle, because a lot of people get worried that, well, these enhanced e-commerce features, and I'm not enhanced e-commerce, and geez, all this great stuff, and there's nothing for me. Not true. We've actually been working with a number of customers take some of these features and pivot them away from e-commerce and to take advantage of the idea of analyzing against the customer life cycle based on content consumption. So think of product use instead of as product use, but content consumption, and then categorizing that content into sports, news, obituaries, etc. And then what we're able to do is pivot the idea and the, uh, the great new sexy features of enhanced e-commerce away from being the sole domain of, of an e-commerce company. Okay, good points, John. And maybe as part of the follow-up to this webinar, we can send around some materials on Universal Analytics and, and GTM that can help you out as well. So the next question is, since Google Analytics is only sampled, what are your thoughts on the quality of the data collected? Sampling can be a, an issue for well, a lot of people, but it, if you get a lot of traffic, sampling is clearly going to be an issue. Um, You'll notice this in the reports. If it's applicable to you, you'll all of a sudden see a little sort of warning saying this data is sampled. 
uh, and, and that does create a lot of concern with certain users. Um, it's hard to make decisions when you're not working on the whole data set. If you're not seeing sampling as part of a problem, then you're in good shape. Uh, the more traffic you get, the bigger your business gets, the more successful you are, and the longer the period of time that you analyze, the more likely it is that you might see sampling come in. Uh, one way around this, uh, it's simple conceptually, but it's not necessarily simple in your pocketbook, is to upgrade to Google Analytics Premium. Um, Google Analytics Premium has much, much higher levels uh, of data analysis before you get sampling, and even the ability to get your data out in unsampled formats so you can analyze it offline. Um, the other thing is you can just be patient, I guess, because what we're seeing is radical improvements from the engineers on the Google Analytics team that are continually upping the limits on the free version so that sampling is an issue for less and less people. Um, and another thing too is to look at your time frames. Sometimes you'll see sampling uh, because the time frame you're looking at is just so long and as a result of the long time frame you've just got a huge data set that puts it above that sampling limit. All right, and John, I know you touched on this throughout the session, but we have a lot of people asking about the fact that you used a lot of e-commerce examples. Is this something that can also apply to non-e-commerce organizations? Segmentation and using GA for segmentation and customizing and personalizing the content on your site, your campaign efforts is absolutely something that applies beyond e-commerce. It's not it's not the sole realm of B2C or B2B or B2G or B2E or B2X. Segmentation is an important part of the way that any business should be analyzing their data and looking for new and better ways to identify their most valuable customers, engaging with them on a more personal level. So it's clearly not just an e-commerce thing. And it's not always the realm to, even though I talked about it a lot in this framework today, of your most valuable customers, in certain cases, you'll know deep down that there's a, a really valuable segment to you that just is performing under par. And if we think back to that example where we were first slicing and dicing by age and gender, um, maybe it was females in a certain range because the product was for females. Maybe it was makeup and beauty products. And clearly we'd expect that group to perform better. But if it wasn't that way, and even if it was the opposite, if it was a product that was more focused on men, and we saw that we just weren't engaging with them properly, we really want to look back at how our customer lifecycle communication and touch points are actually working to figure out why we're missing the mark so badly. And again, that extends beyond just uh, the e-commerce examples into content consumption for publishers and beyond. Okay, thanks, John. The, we've got a lot of really great, great questions uh, that have come in, and I know, John, you have to catch a flight, so we are going to end it here, but as promised, we will follow up with those of you who posed questions that we haven't addressed yet. So, John, thanks for the presentation. Thank you to everyone joining us for this special CRO Day event. Keep an eye out for some follow-up materials, including the recording of this session, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now.